Thank you uh, for that introduction, um, Alan. Um, and thank you to SIPFA for the invitation uh, to speak. SIPFA is a founder member of uh, my organization, and so it's, it's a real pleasure to take part in this uh, latest annual conference. Um, I do have some slides. Um, I do have some PowerPoint. Um, I hope they're not deathly. Um, but if they do anything, they will take away that rather large uh, picture of myself. Um, which is of, of, uh, of benefit to me. Are the slides going to come up? Can somebody help me just get the slides to come up on the screen, please? Oh, it's working. Great. Um, so over the next uh, uh, 15 to 20 minutes, I hope to be able to tell you uh, and communicate something about the objectives and principles um, that underpin the work of the organization that I help um, to lead and why I think those objectives and principles are important in the current financial uh, and political climate. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about uh, the importance of transparency to good governance, uh, particularly in the public sector, um, and then cover how effective scrutiny and audit can add value um, to both management of public finances uh, and measuring the outcomes from spend. Um, and finally, something about how scrutiny and audit um, can act as a powerful influence um, on whole system leadership. Um, I'm going to speak mostly from a UK perspective because that's where most of my experience comes from, but I think that the principles and objectives I'm going to talk about um, translate across uh, uh, boundaries. Um, I'm not going to dwell on all of the points on all of the slides. A lot of those points are really for you to get hold of the slides and the presentation um, after the event and use it as, uh, as some background. Um, so let me start just by um, saying a little bit about the organisation I work for. Uh, the Centre for Public Scrutiny is a leading uh, governance and scrutiny organisation. Um, we promote transparent, inclusive and accountable public services. And we work through thought leadership, for example, influencing um, legislation, uh, responding to public sector consultations, and providing policy support through strategic roundtable discussions uh, or advice to government departments. We also provide a lot of practical support that helps people tackle big issues in their local context, for example, in local government, uh, in health and social care, education, criminal justice, uh, and in social housing. And although we're most, most active in the public sector, uh, we do work in the private sector too um, to support better scrutiny of project and risk management, particularly where those projects are delivering um, uh, services for the public. We're very passionate about the business of govern, uh, governance and decision making, the cultures and values of organisations uh, and the actions and behaviours of individuals who either take decisions or who have a role to uh, hold those decision makers to account. Now sometimes governance, scrutiny and accountability are regarded as barriers, uh, the bar regarded as barriers to innovation, barriers to growth or barriers to change. But our aim is to promote a role for scrutiny and accountability to underpin discussions about big issues that help to tackle uh, difficult problems and that act as a, as a bridge between people who plan and run services and people who use those services and pay for them. And this seems particularly important uh, in the context of continuing, in, continuing financial austerity in the public sector and the emerging post-truth environment uh, in which we now seem to be living. More and more these days, it seems that the spotlight is shining on things that can go wrong when governance is not right. Rightly, public outcry is an appropriate response to system failures, and subsequent inquiries often um, uncover inadequacies in both policy and practice. These inadequacies aren't restricted just to um, the policy and practice of decision makers though often failure to scrutinize or speak up are also identified and i believe that good governance is really about credibility the credibility of individuals the credibility of organizations uh, and indeed the credibility of whole sectors it's not very hard to find examples of what i mean 
risky individual behaviour, the failure of organisational boards to uh, control management practice, or the accepted customer practice across whole industries or sectors carrying on without question or challenge. In the UK, we've seen all of these through high profile failures in our charity and voluntary sector, our retail sector, our health and social care sector, and our media sector. And recently, we've experienced it in our parliamentary and political system. And no doubt you can identify other examples from your own context. Now, transparency through declarations of interests and adoptions of code of conduct can set a common understanding um, of the fundamental building blocks of personal values and behaviour in public life. These values set the tone for the culture of public service and act as an indicator of the broader leadership role of politicians and public servants. Clear processes for whistleblowing are also important, although developing mechanisms that allow everybody's voice to be heard routinely can help avoid triggering this extreme form of scrutiny. The best organisations build these kinds of values into their culture and the way that they do business. And along, that's alongside other equally important elements of governance such as audit and reporting. However, these values and processes are not about just about discouraging corruption. That's important, but putting transparency and citizen engagement at the heart of decisions about public finance has several potential benefits and the uh, OECD has noted six. Um, first, that budget decisions have a significant impact uh, on the public and therefore need to be informed by the values uh, uh, of the views and values of citizens. Second, that engaging citizens increases the information available to decision makers about the potential effects of decisions and that helps guard against uh, unintended consequences. Thirdly, Citizen scrutiny can help ensure that decision makers are diligent in the decisions they make, improving the efficiency, responsiveness and accountability of government. Fourthly, engaging citizens in the trade-offs faced by decision makers generates a much more fruitful conversation between um, government uh, and citizens. Fifthly, engaging citizens can help overcome public distrust and cynicism and increase the legitimacy of government. And finally, it can lead to government just being more responsive to the needs and values of citizens. But I think that transparency must move beyond the traditional publication of historic data. It's got to be about providing, a range, uh, uh, providing information in ways that people can easily understand and interpret. It's also about being clear how organisations are run and how people can influence strategic direction and operational performance. Contextual information gives people a powerful tool that helps them get involved and have a say about how services work and how services respond to people's needs and aspirations. And being transparent about information and decision making means that inclusiveness is not restricted to meeting traditional or legal duties to involve. It's about using a range of ways for different people and groups to have their voices heard and for their voices to be listened to understood and responded to in credible ways. Being inclusive means being open to hearing different views about how to improve services and tackle inequalities. And I don't think accountability is restricted to traditional or formal authorization and assessment processes. It's actually about allowing others to make informed judgments about credibility. And accountability is as much about celebrating success as it is about analyzing failure. So today we're talking about accountability for public money, and it's here that I think scrutiny and audit can be a really powerful partnership. I think there are four opportunities where audit and scrutiny can help inform policy development and uh, hold decision makers to account. Firstly, looking at inputs and process, asking questions about whether decisions have been taken in the right way. Secondly, looking at outputs, whether policies are being implemented as intended. Thirdly, looking at outcomes, asking whether intended outcomes are being achieved. And fourthly, looking at aspiration, asking whether the bar of ambition is being raised. 
Now, I'm not going to dwell on the uh, detail of this slide, but it illustrates what we regard as the different but complementary roles of scrutiny uh, and audit. It illustrates some of the key features of each role, uh, which together make them a very powerful combination. The technical, professional, standards-driven approach of audit and the reflexive, whole-system approach of scrutiny. Insight from audit, accounting and other financial control systems are incredibly important as part of the broader scrutiny of public sector policy and performance. After all, organisational budgets are the ambitions and priorities of that organisation written down in numbers. And as this combination of audit and scrutiny is becoming ever more important with the rise of new service delivery mechanisms, this is especially true where those rely on diverse partnership arrangements. This combination of audit and scrutiny is illustrated again here. I believe that at a basic level, accountability for public finance starts with some simple questions. On the scrutiny side, what do we spend money on? This is about our priorities. How do we work out whether we generate value from spending? This is about our outcomes. And should we be doing something different? This is about our vision. <coughs> On the audit side, how much has been spent? This is about financial control. Has spending been properly recorded? This is about probity. And what do we know about risk? This is about developing resilience. So the Centre for Public Scrutiny has developed four principles that point towards the behaviours that help get the best outcomes from scrutiny, audit and other aspects of accountability, so that they combine with decision making to operate as a whole reflexive system. They are constructive challenge, amplifying people's voices, independence and driving improvement. In other words, scrutiny, audit and accountability must be valuable, it must be inclusive, it must be flexible, and it must be different. And reverse behaviours raise the risk of scrutiny, audit and accountability becoming oppositional, not evidence-based, over-controlled and not influential. In other words, they risk becoming obstructive, parochial, pressurised and simply wasted. This slide illustrates in more detail what I've been saying about developing a reflexive system, and it recognises the valuable contribution that scrutiny can make, particularly a contribution to place-based change as public spending reduces and demands and expectations on services change, along with changes in the ways that people want to experience and engage with services. Underpinning all of this, should be a, recogni a recognition of the triangular relationship between executives, officials and scrutiny. Of course, most of you will be very familiar with the challenges uh, in accounting for public money. We recognise several common challenges uh, for scrutiny from our own work across a range of settings, whether national or local. What to consider, how you decide on priorities, how to consider it, who do you need to hear from, and getting people to take any notice when you've done your work about making evidence-based recommendations. And although the context is different, I think it's equally difficult for members of national parliaments to get governments to act differently, as it is for locally elected councillors to influence local government leaders, or for school or hospital governors to influence teachers and clinicians. This slide highlights some research carried out by SOLAS the organisation that supports senior managers in UK local government. And it illustrates much of what I've been saying about moving beyond traditional public sector operating models, moving beyond traditional organisational boundaries and funding flows and moving beyond traditional relationships between organisations and the people they serve. So far, I've concentrated a lot on the positives of transparency, scrutiny and accountability, but I need to acknowledge that there can be difficulties with them, especially where they apply to a political environment, and especially when there is tension between political parties, between political leaders and officials, or perhaps where an unhelpful media takes opportunities to build mistrust. Now, financial scrutiny can have some particular challenges. It can be political because politics is about values and ideas. It can highlight tensions, but there may be no right answers. 
It can be perceived as being very technical, but remember it's just somebody's vision written down in numbers. And it's different from audit, although audit is a very important part of scrutiny. Now some people have argued that what needs to be done is to take all of this out of the hands of politicians by creating independent financial institutions. For example, in the UK, the Office of Budget Responsibility. Now I understand the argument, but I think there's a risk that that view devalues the role of elected representatives. What needs to change perhaps is not the depoliticization of financial decision making and scrutiny, but a more uh, inclusive approach to politics. That may be the topic of a separate conference. But democracy um, really can have an impact when unpopular decisions are taken. For example, the election to the UK Parliament of a doctor campaigning against hospital closures. What's clear to me, however, is there is a risk for politi politicians in their representational role. For example, campaigning to keep open a service that is not safe is not in the public interest. A key question I think we have to ask political leaders is what impact does financial and other data have on your decision making? It seems to me that we can have all the best professional standards and evidence in the world sitting behind the data being generated and published, but what is that worth if political leaders or indeed people with a scrutiny role don't use them to inform their thinking? Financial accountability and scrutiny is crucial in today's rapidly changing world. It needs to challenge whether internal processes are effective. Is there a connection between strategy, service planning, and performance and financial management? It needs to challenge the assumptions that lie behind resource allocation and the demonstration of value. It needs to bring financial issues off the balance sheet, out of the budget book, and into the public domain because behind all of that financial mystique, I think, lie three very fundamental questions about value. What do we value enough to spend money on? When we spend the money, do we measure the value of the money or the value for the money? And are we only concerned with financial cost or do we care about social value? So, as I move towards a conclusion, I particularly like what um, SITFA has been saying about developing integrated reporting uh, for, the public, for public sector services. And I'm sure there's plenty to learn from this conference about how scrutiny and audit can be used to, uh, to increase focus on value. There are undoubtedly more opportunities for citizens to get involved themselves. And there are already examples from around the world, such as approaches to participatory budgeting and other measures of engaging people in tough decisions. For example, Luxembourg itself has recently completed a citizen forum on, uh, on taxation designed to measure how the person in the street feels about taxation. 60 citizen representatives were involved and transparency, morality, clear, accurate information and equity emerged as major values. Other examples of citizen uh, engagement and activism um, come from uh, various parts of the world. For example, uh, an initiative called Springtide in Canada, based on judging ideas where they may lead rather than who had the ideas. Um, citizen investor in the US, encouraging investment in public projects that people care most about. NHS citizen in the UK, which is about influencing the direction of healthcare policy. Botswana's uh, budget consultation forums, South Korea's citizen audit request system, and of course the iterations of participatory budgeting that uh, began in uh, Porto Alegre in Brazil and have now spread around the world. These examples are important because the challenges we face are too great to be left to politicians, to professionals, or to citizens alone. We increasingly need to identify solutions together despite apparent signs of a drift to the contrary. Now this slide illustrates how processes of decision making that are transparent and inclusive can connect the civil space and the civic space. The civil space where people exist, where people interact, where society um, does its business, uh, the civic space inhabited by representatives, the overarching um, purpose of uh, public leaders to uh, understand risk and develop resilience, 
the interface between the civil space and the civic space being that, dis that decision-making role through transparency and involvement, demonstrating ambition and good outcomes, which supports democracy, brings prosperity and health in the civil space, and represents uh, accountable, transparent and inclusive power and influence in the civic space. Recently, I came across the Open Budget Index. It's an index of central government transparency measured by citizen access to key doc, uh, government financial information and papers. In the 2015 index, the top five countries were New Zealand, Sweden, South Africa, Norway, and the USA. France, the UK, Italy, and Germany all came in the top 15. But being transparent is one thing, being truly accountable and allowing citizens to influence is another. So finally, I want to leave you with these three key messages, which are about the value of public accountability and scrutiny. They're not red tape, they support openness and credibility, and they're absolutely vital to ensure probity and safety. They're important checks and balances that add value to democracy. And there are lots of lessons from the past where they don't, that can go, about things that can go wrong when they don't have respect or investment. And finally, they're a bridge between powerful people and the people to build knowledge, skills, and trust. And this is vital to solve the challenges that we face. Thank you for listening.